My, is my level good, Rich? Yeah. Am I good? A student's son is visiting his father and upon arrival is clearly upset about something. This kid's at college. So his dad asked him, what's the matter? And the son replies that he's just had a horrible first date with a girl, a really pretty girl that he likes. His dad said, what happened? And the son said, well, she asked me if I go to college. And I said, no. Then she asked me if I drive a Mercedes. And I said, no. Finally, she asked me if I live in a two-story home. And I said, I don't. She said, I've wasted my time. She got up and left the restaurant. And sympathetically, the dad replies, son, if you really like this girl, I would support you dropping out of Harvard and re enrolling in some college. <laughs> you could sell your Ferrari and get a Mercedes. But to give up your three-story mansion for this girl, I forbid it. <laughs> he was just being truthful, you know. This sermon is about getting ready to be prepared. <laughs> I think I just deleted it. But I'll find it. Yeah, I did delete it, and here it is. Okay. First uh, Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, if you want to turn there. If you don't, that's okay. We're also going to be in Genesis chapter 6. But First Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer <clears throat> to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Would you bow your heads with me again? Dear Lord, we thank you this morning for the power that's in these morsels of truth from your word. And we ask that you direct the word to where you want it to go and that it'll have the effect that you want it to have. In Jesus' name, amen. So being prepared, that is to be ready to do what God calls you to do, is something a lot of people don't think about and some people even avoid. And I am one who did that. Probably more than once if I think hard about it. In, uh, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 7 to 9, it says this, So the Lord said, I will, wipe, I, will wipe, I will wipe from the face of the earth the race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground. For I regret that I have made them. So God announced a plan to destroy the human race and even the animals. But, but Noah, in verse 8, found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Can we sell, say that Noah was ready? He found favor in the eyes of the Lord, although everyone else in creation was evil. Noah found favor. No blame could be applied to him. Walking faithfully with God was Noah's uh, preparation. It, it made him ready to hear from God. Walking with God can only happen with faith. If you don't believe in him, you're not going to walk with him. Because he was ready to hear from God. He was able to believe what God was telling him was true. I'm going to destroy. He was ready to believe that. Anybody else wouldn't have believed it in that time. But he was ready. Genesis 6.22 Noah did everything just as God commanded him. 
These instructions were preposterous in human thinking. Oh yeah, I'm going to build a boat. Oh sure, all these animals are going to be in there. Oh sure, it's going to rain. Oh sure, the flood's going to cover the earth. Oh sure, everybody's going to be destroyed. This was preposterous in human thinking. Preposterous. But he did it. Build an ark, 300 cubits. Do you know what a cubit is? This is a cubit. It's about 18 inches. It depends on how big the person is. At one time they said this is the king's forearm. What would most of us say? You know, all the animals? You mean lions too? You mean tigers? You mean snakes? What about rats? Every kind of animal? What, what would we say? Noah was 500 plus years old when his sons were born. So he was 600 when the, when the flood came. So he labored approximately 100 years to build the ark. And he probably had some help from his sons and uh, the sons' wives, but nobody else on the earth would have helped him do this ridiculous task. It was just silly. But God said, do it. Noah had faith. Noah walked with God. He said, yes, I'll do it. A hundred years worth of I'll do it. Abraham was ready to do the unlikely, strange, uncomfortable act that God was directing him to do. Genesis 12, 1, the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. In other words, get away from everything you're familiar with. Go where I show you. He didn't even tell him where he was going. Go to where the culture is different. The people are different. They wear different kinds of clothes. They don't even speak the same language. Just go. How many of us would do that? Abraham was ready to trust God. He was ready to be prepared to do that. Genesis 12, 4, so Abram went just as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Abraham had an amazing life. He never went back to Haran, never went back to Ur, all because he was ready, ready to be prepared to do God's will. How about Moses? Moses wasn't ready at first. He wasn't even willing. He didn't want to do it. God got his attention with the burning bush. Exodus 3, 9 to 11. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I? I can't do this. I'm a shepherd. Moses argued with God two or three times. He wasn't ready to be prepared. Some of us do resist the call when it first comes. Moses said in, in Exodus 4 and verse 1, Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say the Lord did not appear to you? And in Exodus 4.10, Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in, the pa neither in the past, nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. He, he did, he's trying to get out of doing this. Trying to get out of it. Of doing what God's calling him to do. In Exodus 4.13, Moses said, Pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. Let somebody else do it. And that's pretty common today among Christian believers. Lord, let somebody else do it when, he's, when he speaks to us about doing a thing. Um, you know, can't you get somebody else to do that? 
So Moses was not only not ready, but he was also resistant. But maybe he was ready. God chose him. He was ready in a sense. God knew what he would do. God had to wear his resistance down. All God needs is someone who is willing. If you're willing, he will get you ready. He will, he will prepare you. If you're willing. You know, when I had a calling to be a minister, that's the last thing I wanted to do. And I'm comfortable with it. But I was a lay preacher for 20 years, and I was comfortable getting up and speaking to people. People got saved. I went in the hospital and visited people. I did funerals. I was called on to help the pastor a whole lot. And I was very comfortable in that. And people would say, oh, you know, you should be a minister. You, you, you do this well. And, and I'd say, I don't want to hear that. I have a business, you know, I, don't, I have a business. And I didn't want to, I didn't. I was being prepared, but I didn't know that he was going to... The Lord kind of insisted. <laughs> but I was sitting in my office at Christmas time. I don't know how long ago this was. Ten years? Nine years? I don't know. I don't remember. And the thoughts came to me about, about becoming an, a real minister. <laughs> And I said this prayer. I said, Lord, do you really want me to do that? That was a prayer. And the presence of God came. And the witness of the Spirit came onto me. And I started crying. And I couldn't stop crying for several minutes. And I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> I didn't respond well to that. But... I had arguments, three arguments, three days in a row after that. And I argued with God at night with, a, with an excuse. And I read a, a one-year Bible every morning. And every morning in one-year Bible, that scripture came to answer that objection that I had. He answered all my objections with verses that came in the morning after my objection came at night. So... I finally thought, how can I get out of this? I know. I'll go see my pastor, and he'll tell me I'm too old. I was 65. Well, that didn't work. <laughs> I said, can this happen at my age? I told him, what, you know, with the calling. He said, absolutely. <laughs> and instead of thinking, I don't want to do this, then that changed my attitude. I thought... How am I going to do this? You take the courses and you get certified and you start preaching. So it wasn't that different from what I'd been doing, except I accepted the challenge and I became ready to be prepared. Ready to be prepared. I had a burden for souls. I led people to, to, to the Lord. So you can be ready but not convinced. If God wants you to do something... And he wants all of us to do something. He will prepare you to do it. It doesn't take a large, powerful person to do something for God. It just takes all of that person that there is. It just takes all of you. Not, not that you're eloquent or, or big or strong. Or, or, or It just takes all of you that there is. Say, Lord, here I am. What, what do you want me to do? What would you like me to do? How about David? David was convinced that he could kill Goliath. He was convinced. He was ready. Because he had killed a lion and he had killed a bear. He knew he could do it. He knew he could. 1 Samuel 17, 45 and 46. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. See, David's faith 
prepared him. He knew that God would give him the victory. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't the lion and the bear. That was part of it. But he had faith in God because God strengthened him to dispatch the lion and the bear. He couldn't do that. He was a man and not a real big one. He was just a, a, a shepherd boy at that time. And he knew what the power of God would be like. It was David's faith that prepared him. He knew God would give him the victory. He knew it. He faced the giant with so much power and faith because it was God using him and he knew it. So David's faith would bring him a lot of victories all of his life. He was a warrior king. Faith may be the greatest preparer. It may be the greatest preparer. The great heroes of the Old Testament were either prepared or became prepared. God called them. God prepared them. They had to get out of their comfort zone. They operated outside of the familiar life. Whatever you depend on to be comforted with, everything be the same around you and the comfort. For, and God called these people out of that. I was anything but a leader, a born leader. I was an introvert, antisocial, unwilling to get involved. I was kind of a loner. I have no idea what she saw in me. I can't figure that out yet. Maybe it was just potential. But the last person you would ever think would stand up in front of people and say anything, the last person was me. The last one. I wouldn't be a speaker of any kind. Then God called me out of a worldly life. And I got saved. Oh. And the preparation began. The Word prepared me. Listening to preachers prepared me. Encounters with believers prepared me. We encourage one another to do things for God. We don't come all ready. We, we don't come into it ready to do all that stuff. We don't come ready. When God wants you to do something, He will prepare you to do it. He gets us ready. But you just have to be ready to be prepared. Ready to be prepared. Sometimes it's a miracle. It was a miracle that I became a preacher. I didn't want anything to do with that. Maybe it's always a miracle. Noah wasn't a boat builder. He wasn't a carpenter. He was a farmer. He became a boat builder, something completely out of his comfort zone, so he could do God's bidding. Abraham had never been to Canaan. He didn't know the language there. He traveled there because God said go. And he went there to be in God's will. Moses wasn't a leader. He was a shepherd at this point. But he came a, became a leader. And he led two to three million people out of bondage. Two to three million to the land that God had promised Abraham. Billy Graham just wanted to be a little country church pastor. <laughs> that wasn't his comfort zone to be in stadiums where thousands of people were coming forward. He just wanted, he said, I just wanted to be a little country preacher. Where is that, North Carolina, South Carolina? Where he was in the Carolinas there. Jesus spent three years traveling around with his disciples, showing them what they could do in his name. He prepared them. They still weren't ready to do his will, so he promised a helper, the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26 to 27, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. 
Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Don't be afraid to do the task that I've called you to do. The tasks of Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, and so many others seem enormous. But they had God's help. They couldn't fail. And they didn't. Our task seems enormous. The world is hostile to the message that we carry because it, it, it opposes their narrative. We have an ancient enemy, bigger than Goliath. But our enemy is God's enemy. We're not alone. We have the advocate. No persecution has ever been able to destroy the message. Lots and lots and lots of them have tried. They're still trying. They're not going to destroy the message. Many Christians died. Missionaries are still dying. You know, if you, if you admit to being a Christian in North Korea, it's a death sentence. They don't want to hear it. It doesn't fit their hero worship, their cult worship narrative. But the message is still being heard. God is still preparing those who are willing to carry the gospel. We have someone bigger than the enemy on our side. Bigger. Used to be churches were all full. Pastors preached a message. People got blessed and healed. And but the enemy is pulling stuff on us today. People are getting absorbed in their own self, their own agendas, and a lot of churches are dwindling. This church used to have, what, 60 people in it at one time? We have 100 seats here. Was there 60 at one time? Around 60 or 70 maybe at one time? But Jesus said, don't be afraid. In other words, what you see can discourage you. Can discourage me as a pastor. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged by what you see. In today's world, it's easy to have a troubled heart. Seeing what's happening to our beloved country, the ungodly becoming commonplace. Gay marriage, earth worship, abortion, and even infanticide is enough to cause a troubled heart. But instead of a troubled heart, we have a willing heart. We're willing to be prepared to carry the gospel and make a difference in somebody's life. God knows who we can depend on. Is it you? Are you the one he can depend on? I hope all of you can say, yeah, that's me. I hope you can all say that. Can he depend on you? Do you have a willing heart? Are you the willing one? Are you ready to be prepared? If you think you can't, do the task God thinks that you can do the task otherwise he wouldn't call you to do it God thinks you can you only need to be willing to be ready to be prepared if a no account introverted guy like me used to be can do it so can anyone else anyone else just be willing to hear from God and do whatever he wants you to do I left that space for an amen right there amen. <laughs> see I used to have this little Scotty Bob Scotty Bob missile plaque here 
and it says, can I get an amen? So I used to hold that up. And then I would say, can I get a witness? But this church, these church, these people beg, make me beg for amens. They do. I have to plead sometimes. But I love every one of them anyway. <laughs> Are you the willing one? Just be willing to hear from God and do whatever he wants. We don't do things for God in our own power. We will fail every time. Every time. In Spanish, con Dios, you know, puedo fallar. That means with God I cannot fail. We used to have some Spanish peop people here and it was fun to... I don't know much Spanish, but they would humor me a little bit. <laughs> I'm ready to be prepared. The preparing never stops. The willingness is the first step. God will do the preparing. I didn't, uh, I didn't intend to mention this, but did you ever hear of William Seymour? Did you ever hear of William Seymour? Did you ever hear of Azusa Street? William Seymour was the one that had the Azusa Street Revival. He was a one-eyed black holiness preacher. The holiness movement came out of the Methodist movement and they were, I don't know what their difference was with Methodism, but they were trying to um, have a more powerful relationship with God. And then out of that, in Topeka, Kansas, a woman named, um, well, a guy named Charles Parham at a Bible school there. And in this holiness movement, there were people that were studying for the, about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, was speaking in other tongues, and became convinced that that could happen in our time. So Agnes Oseman was in this Bible school, and she got the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Then Charles Parham went down to... Texas, Corpus Christi, maybe, I'm not sure. He went down to Texas, having meetings down there with the same thing. He assigned the students to look into this baptism in the Holy Spirit thing. And um, William Seymour heard about this, and he, he, he wanted to look into it himself. So he went there. And in those days, it was illegal for a black person to be in the same classroom where the white people are. So he rose above that and went and asked if he could sit out in the hallway and listen. And that's what he did. He wasn't offended. He wanted as much of God as he could possibly get. And he listened. He became convinced that the bastards and the Holy Spirit could be done, could be a thing for today. He went out, he was invited to go out and speak in a, in a, in a black hole in his church in, in California, in Los Angeles. And when he went there and started speaking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they padlocked him out of the church. They wouldn't allow him in there. They padlocked the church. So there was a guy, he was a, he was a, a janitor, I think, and his wife, and he, Seymour had nowhere to go. He was homeless, no money, no nothing. And so they invited him to come and stay at their house. He started having Bible studies about the baptism of the Holy Spirit in their house on Bonnie Bray Street in Los Angeles. And there were so many people that came that there were no room in the house for them. And they went out on the porch and they started having these meetings out on the porch and the porch caved in. So they had to find another place. And they went to Azusa Street. The building was a really crumbly building. There are pictures of it, it's not there anymore. <clears throat> but upstairs, there were rooms that had been a warehouse, and downstairs that had been used for a stable, a livery. So you know what that would be like. But they put a load of sawdust in there, and some people got uh, orange crates and put planks across them and made benches. And his pulpit was two crates that had shoes in them, shoe boxes, crates. That was his pulpit. <clears throat> and people started getting filled with the Holy Spirit, getting healed. 
and the modern Pentecostal movement. All the Pentecostal churches trace their roots back to Azusa Street. William Seymour, <clears throat> a one-eyed black preacher, holiness preacher. And he was preaching about it. People get it, and he didn't have it himself. And he finally got it. There's, uh, there, there are uh, stories about him on, on YouTube. You can look him up. It's amazing. And <clears throat> there were all kinds of people there. And those, those were days when there was racial tension. But there were black people and white people and Chinese people and all kinds of people there worshiping together and fellowshipping in, in beautiful harmony. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. They had, they had a 100th anniversary of that. I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, I'm not sure. But it, it was a while ago. They had a 100th anniversary of that. I didn't mean to bring that up. But what was Parham, not Parham, what was uh, Seymour doing? He was praying five hours a day. Five hours a day. And he asked the Lord one time, what should I do? And the Lord said, pray more. So he went up to seven hours a day. But the millions of Pentecostals all over the world trace their, trace their heritage back to that movement and that man. Because he was ready to be prepared to do what God wanted him to do. Look at all the, the Methodist preachers that came on horseback and brought the gospel. The gospel came to Phillipsburg by a Methodist preacher that was too poor to afford saddlebags so he could put food in there for his horse. And he rode a circuit out of, uh, I think, Lancaster. I'd have to look it up. And what he did, he took his boots off and filled his boots with horse food and slung the boots across across the, where the saddlebags would be because he couldn't afford saddlebags. That's what he did. He was so determined to bring the gospel and he preached here in Phillipsburg. Isn't that cool? Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? But the gospel first came to Phillipsburg. I didn't mean to say any of this stuff. It's 1204. It first came to Phillipsburg when a Phillips family that owned all this ground around here in England and they advertised that they wanted to have 12, I think it was 12 people that would come and they would give each one of them a lot in the town and a, and a plot outside the town to grow food, have a farm. So they got a home and a small farm. One of them was a Lutheran minister. So the very first settlement, the gospel came here with the Lutheran minister. I think he preached in a tavern on Sunday. I'd have to go back and look at that again. But that's... God is doing a new thing. He's going to send people in this church. A new thing. Some of them were here today. Some of them were here last week. One of those people here last week got saved. I led her to the Lord after church. Maybe he wants you to be an instrument to bring someone to him. Maybe he wants you to do that. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and with respect. So our challenge is to share the word. You get prepared to share it by reading it. Making notes of... I think five scriptures I use to lead someone to the Lord. There are different methods of doing that. But it's a challenge for all of us to grow this church, not because of the empty seats, not because of the building, but because of the people that need God. That's a challenge for this church. When I say this church, it's not the building, it's you guys. The pastor's job is to prepare the saints for works of service. That's the scripture. 
So that's my job, and that's what I'm doing right now, trying to. But you're, you need to be ready. Are you, are, you, are you willing to be prepared? Do you, would you accept that challenge? Do you want to be a soul winner? Do you want to be a soul winner? Do you want to be? That's the question for you today. It's not, you know, it's not, I'll bring them to church and they'll get saved. And, and hey, they'll, they'll hear the gospel if they come here. But it's so thrilling to lead someone to the Lord. That made my day last Sunday. It's so thrilling. Why would you want to? Why wouldn't you want to do that and have that blessing for your own self instead of giving me all that blessing? So I usually say, get them saved and then bring them to church. But either way, either way, you know, we have the gospel. We have the precious blood of Jesus. We have the Lord. We have it. So let's not keep it to ourselves. Let's not keep all bound up in it. Let's, let's share it. Let's go out and share it. I'm going to close with this song.